Dr. Rachel Harris, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you, David. <laughs> well, it's great to have you here. We were just uh, chatting a little bit before turning on the recorders here about the some of the commonalities in our background. We have uh, very similar experiences in some ways, probably know a lot of people in common. Uh, but let's let's start with giving our audience a bit of a sketch of your training and background. Sure. Well, when I graduated from college, I went right to Esalen, which is a little different than going into a graduate program. <laughs> really? So wow. I was, right out of I college. Was 20, yeah. I was 21 years old, and I went right from Boston University to the Esalen Institute residential program. Yeah. How special. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, prob probably most of my audience will be familiar with, with Esalen, but we should just mention we we're talking, it was a a very uh, uh, hot, buzzing <laughs> growth center yeah. in it Big Sur. It was hot and buzzing, yeah. Yeah, uh, Big Sur, California, and with uh, lots of the uh, psychologists who were well-known in the area of the human potential movement and so on. And um, and so uh, the house, what a special experience that was. I've, I've been at Esalen. I've done some workshops through Esalen, and um, and it's just an incredible piece of property and an incredible sort of spiritual center uh, with, with great energy and, and a great view. <laughs> a great view, yes. Well, this was 1968, and I had been I had already been searching for that intersection of psychotherapy and Eastern religion. And so that's how I ended up there. And I think this was the third uh, formal residential program and there were okay. 11 of us and it was a five-month program and we worked for 40 and 50 hours a week with different workshop leaders that were the big ones back then yeah, and, yeah. and we went to Tassajara and we got Rolfed you know we sort of did everything yeah yeah Rolfing I got Rolfed by uh by somebody who was studying Rolfing <laughs> Oh, sorry uh, about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so uh, we're going to be talking about your current book, which is about to come out, right? Is it came out May 9, so it's available. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's already it's available. Out. People are getting it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's called Swimming in the Sacred. And it seems to be a bit of a follow on to your earlier book, Listening to Ayahuasca. So what's the relationship between the two? Well, you know, they are connected. The listening to ayahuasca was really specifically about that medicine. Um, swimming in the sacred is a broader view, but uh, it's based on in-depth interviews with women elders who have been working underground for at least 20 years, and many of them 30, 40, even 50 years. So wow, yeah. the eldest of the elders in her late 80s, just to give you some perspective. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And But the reason th these women, they're still working underground, so they're doubly silenced. They're silenced as women because of the gender issue. And then they're silenced because they're working illegally. So they continue to work underground. They really cannot go out in public and speak at, at conferences. And I'm the first person that they agreed to talk to. That's really special. And and I note that you also had personal experience with ayahuasca as well. That must have helped to facilitate the connection. Well, I think I think that book um gave them the the confidence to, to be willing to talk to me. They kind yeah. of knew who I was from that book. Also, I shared, you know, some of them had been at Esalen and around the same time I had been there. We kind of knew people together. There was a connection in our backgrounds that yeah. opened things up. Yeah. Well, in the book, you go into some detail about why you chose women and why you chose elders, and why you chose people who are underground. Let's go through all of that. Well, you know, it's the underground elders who have the most experience in, in our Western culture in North America. These women have the most experience with entheogens because they worked for, for a very long time on themselves, and then they've been working with clients for decades. 
And so they really know the territory in a way that even the research teams don't have the same in-depth, intuitive gra grasping of the, of the different realms. So these are the these are the real experts. It's a different kind of expertise than the research data, but it's a legitimate expertise. And I didn't want their perspective, their voices to be lost. So in some ways, especially as I was having these long interviews with them, I realized that I'm gathering history here. So uh, very much I didn't want them to be lost. Yeah, yeah. And um, that was a, a sort of an interesting angle to me. Like if I were doing research, it would not have occurred to me to, you know, to reach out to that sort of a sample. Uh, and yet the the points that you make around that, uh, the rationale for doing that, it's very compelling, makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, that it, plus the, I think you're concerned that that their knowledge might be lost. Um, you know, some of them might be older. I don't know. Uh, they, there was quite an age range, right? No, no, they're all they're all at least sixty, and most of them are over seventy. Okay. And the eldest of the elders is in her late eighties. Yeah, yeah. So that's and great. And she had she had a very big impact on me. She's, uh, you know, of course, the most experienced, and because she she. She started working with these medicines really in during the 60s decade. She was mentored by um, uh, Stolaroff, who had been mentored by uh, Leo Zeff. And, and I encourage people to read uh, their book. Uh, Myron Stolaroff interviewed Leo Zeff, and it's called um, The Secret Chief Revised. And, and it's, uh, it's his personal story. Yeah, am I right that Leo Zeff was a prominent Jungian? Yes, he was, um, and he retired and in the early '60s, and then he discovered the entheogens back then called psychedelics, yeah. and they were. He felt they were so important that he came out of retirement to work with people with the psychedelics. Yeah! Wow. Uh, what an interesting background you bring to all of this. And it's particularly interesting to me because uh, I've been involved uh, before I retired. For years, I was involved with uh, doing uh, uh, qualitative research. And essentially, this is a qualitative research study, but, <laughs> but very different. Very different, <laughs> it's, yes. It's, it's kind of an, un, you know, I was working for commercial uh, clients like uh, Texas Instruments and Hewlett Packard <laughs> Apple Computer and so on. Yeah, they uh, never so, called me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But they might have been dabbling in, in some of these. <laughs> they might have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think so. I think we know that yeah. now. Well, that you know, the other historic thing was I interviewed Houston Smith's wife, widow. You yes. know, Houston died uh, five or six years ago, but his his. Uh, widow is turning 100 this summer wow. yeah. and so in 1960 Aldous Huxley was um, Houston was at MIT in the religion department and he invited Aldous Huxley to come be a visiting faculty and Aldous said yes he would come and you should check out this young psychologist at Harvard so that was Timothy Leary oh, yes. Houston met with Timothy Leary and yeah. then so what did they do? They arranged over lunch to do a, a trip, a, a psychedelic trip. Oh, and my God. so Houston yeah. and his wife went to Timothy Leary's home and they they ate psilocybin. I think it was in capsules. And I think Kendra, his wife, had three times as much as Houston did. They both oh had goodness. mystical experiences, really significant life-changing yeah. experiences. And because I know Kendra... I sat with her in her living room and we talked for a couple of hours. And And at the end of um, getting the story of this journey, I asked her, well, you know, to me, this was a historic um, event. Yeah. In 1960, I think it was, or maybe it was January 1, 1961. And I asked Kendra, I said, well, and she's clear as a bell. I asked her, well, has anyone else interviewed you about this early, early experience? And she said, and this is, you know, it's, this is uh, emblematic of women's positions. She said, no, nobody seemed interested. 
Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. 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 What a magnificent uh, opportunity. Uh, I got to hear Timothy Leary speak when I was at the University of Michigan. Uh, also, uh, uh, Ram Das came through oh, the, the circuit, right. you know. Yeah, you were uh, in a good spot. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were yeah, the uh, Michigan turned out to be a really good spot because we had people, some of the other students and some of the junior faculty were going to NTL in Bethel, Maine, National Training Labs to learn about group facilitation and small group work. And so, <laughs> so we were being uh, pollinated by that East Coast influence, and yes. then people coming back from Esalen <laughs> was yes. the other pollinating factor. And so, well, I, you not- know, I I went to the I went to a, an advanced lab at NTL the summer I graduated from college. Okay, so, so I was yeah. there for a two week program, and then from there I drove out and camped. You know, this was 1968, and I drove yeah. out and camped and. Um, went to the Esalen residential program. So I came from one coast to the other. Yeah, yeah. So wow, I, I was really searching. I was really um, trying to find uh, trying to find something that spoke to me about th- these mystical experiences. And I, I had had a number of them as a child, and and I was looking for more and for understanding and what does it mean. And so that's how I got in these situations. Can you say more about the experience that you had as a child? You know, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say too much, but you know, in my book, I in chapter two, I, I, to me, these experiences were like early stepping stones that mm-hmm. I was trying to follow that yeah. would lead somewhere where I didn't know. But yeah. many of the many of the people I know in the psychedelic world and in and many of the elders working underground had very unusual childhood experiences. And I thought I had nice ones. But you know, some of these elders had really far out experiences. Yeah. Of, of children with no drugs involved, and some of them not even asleep. It's not like they were dreams. Um, and they actually, this one woman encountered different entities and had conversations. I didn't have anything that involved, but yeah. I had enough to know that I wanted to follow this. And so I was reading Alan Watts and searching and Aldous Huxley. And, and that's how I found my way into these, uh, into NTLT groups and also into the Esalen residential program. Yeah. Well, you definitely were getting a call. I would say that you yeah, had the call <laughs> and then you were, you were on the path. And, I was on the path. <laughs> and deftly, uh, maybe even being led, I would say guided to, to have these, in, you know, this incredible journey that you've been on. And I have to say, one of the things that impressed me was your, uh, the enormous humility that you bring to the whole process and uh, you know, and, and you uh, and I think that also helped to pave your way with, with some of the people that you were interviewing uh, that, that you really place them, you honor them and sort of the oh, level yeah. that, that they're at and the work that they're doing. And, uh, and you said that, you know, that really you've had a mostly academic and, and therapist type life background and uh but you see them as as real spiritual warriors because yes. they have they have the courage to to work underground to do something that's illegal on the one hand it usually we don't do a lot of honoring of people <laughs> that are Not doing Ill- illegal stuff. Yeah, that's but, true. But, I hadn't thought but, of it that but, way. <laughs> but the psychedelic world, I think, is, is is you know is special as we've come to recognize, and as more of uh, the learning, you know, of of bringing this stuff into the the tent of psychotherapy. And and I should ask you, what are your impressions about? Uh, uh, the openings that are happening in terms of uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. 
Well, it's it's absolutely a burgeoning field, but I want to say one thing about the women, and part of the reason I'm in such awe of them is that they are afraid of nothing. <laughs> they have done all the all the entheogens at all different levels and dosages, and they just, you know, they they just are not afraid. And I'm personally very cautious and careful and afraid of pretty much everything. So this is part of my <laughs> this is part of my awe of them. And and when I started out, I thought I was interviewing psychedelic therapists. You know, this is like the new yeah. term, the new professional opportunity. They're right. not therapists at all. One or two had a license that to practice therapy, but um they are really priestesses. This is quite different. They maintain a sacred practice underground. And one woman even said that if if the medicines became legal, she would continue to practice underground because that's where the sacred container is. So they're very different and from therapists. And I I was in I'm retired now, but I was in private practice for 35, 40 years. You know, it's it's ingrained in my brain, I think, like a therapist. Right. And so I asked one of them, well, what if after the ceremony, someone calls you and says, I want to talk to you about something I experienced and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and she said, well, you know, if they really want to explore it, I would refer them to a simpatico psychotherapist. <laughs> if, <it's, laughs> if it seemed like something that kind of called for another journey, then I would say, let's do another ceremony. Yeah. But yeah. They don't, they, you know, they don't actually see people in a therapeutic way over time. Yeah. Now, as a psychologist, you know that generally uh, psychological studies involve large samples, and your sample actually ended up being just 15 people. So how do you justify that to the outside world? <laughs> Well, it's, you know, you know, with a qualitative study, it's in depth. I mean, I spent hours and hours with these people. Yeah. And um, so I don't have, you know, I did, I did an ayahuasca research study. I had 81 people. That was, I gathered that data in like 2009 to 2011. So it was not so easy finding people who had experienced ayahuasca at least once in North America. So that was a good size group, 81. But this was an in-depth study of women. So these were very intimate, in-depth conversations. And I have to say, I mean, here's the, the slang way of saying it, is after sitting with someone for 10, 12 hours, you know, talking, just talking, having lunch, talking some more, I would get a, and, and no drugs are involved. We're just talking about their right. experiences and, and their apprenticeships and how they came to be, um, to know the territory as well as they do. I would get a contact high. Yeah, which I'm not surprised. Tells you how, <laughs> how permeable I am. And there was, you know, one after the, at the end of a day, We'd had we talked from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon, one meeting with one person, and I'm leaving, and I realize I'm I'm really not fit to drive home. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my my uh my cure for myself was I stopped at a gas station to buy a bag of peanut M and M's. So I got protein and sugar, <laughs> oh. <laughs> tank, <laughs> and drove home. So, oh um, but you know it was. They 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 exude an atmosphere of where they've been. I mean, and this is very uh, amorphous skill based. I mean, therapy is mysterious enough. How do we do what we do? Yeah. But this is even more so because if you think about the client is under a blanket, you know, in the standard protocol with eye shades on and earphones, so there aren't many cues for the sitter, the guide, to pick up on. So these women are are have a highly developed intuitive sense. Many of them talked about feeling something in their bones. So they know the territory so well based on their own experiences that they can kind of travel with somebody. And so that's that's a fascinating kind of process. Um, Indeed, and yeah. And it's it's quite different from sitting you know, in a chair across a sofa from someone doing, you know, regular therapy. 
Um, so they work in a much more mysterious spiritual, and this is why I call them priestesses. Yeah, yeah, makes sense from what you're saying. And uh, and were you surprised that uh, that some of your subjects talked about uh, uh, getting having mystical experiences or getting information from uh, unusual sources, spirit <laughs> guides, uh, yeah. et, et cetera? Well, ancestors. again, this, this is something that the uh, the research teams can't really talk about all that well. <laughs> um, and I no, I wasn't surprised because the listening to ayahuasca book was about my partly in part about my receiving messages from grandmother ayahuasca. So I and I had asked in the research study I did that went into the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs in 2012. Um, I can give you know I can send you a copy of that research if you want for your website. But I had asked because I knew one of these elders even back then. I had consulted with an expert. You know the standard when you're developing a questionnaire, you you talk to the experts in the process of developing the questionnaire. And I asked her, you know, what should I ask? And she gave me one suggestion. She said, ask them if they have an ongoing relationship with the spirit of ayahuasca. And I'm like, sure, I'll ask that. You know, <laughs> hell, <laughs> it was already a 16 page questionnaire. Well, I had an N of 81, more than three quarters of them had an ongoing relationship with the spirit of ayahuasca. It just blew my mind, basically. And so when these underground elders have a relationship with different medicines and and ancestors and 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 their own spiritual guides, I was prepared for it. I understood. And I and this was also part of my choosing to interview only women, is I felt they had a more sensitive relationship with these unseen, unseen others, is what I called them, unseen others. And uh, it's it's very interesting to me, and and they really, um, you know, it's a mix of their own intuition and the guidance that they receive, and again, intuitively, or sometimes they might hear something or see something energetically. It's, it's a whole different realm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm interested in your experiences with ayahuasca. Um, People have uh, suggest you know have offered me opportunities to <laughs> to uh, take ayahuasca in a group setting, and I I have not taken them up on it. I haven't had a psychedelic experience really since the early days, other than some uh, uh, cannabis. But um, and a, a lot of what I've heard. <laughs> It sounded pretty scary, you know, and I really, I didn't feel, well, why would I want to put myself through that? So, <laughs> so it's I, daunting. I got, <laughs> it, it's daunting. <laughs> it is daunting. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah what, you know, what, what, what can you tell us about that, if anything? Well, you know, it, well, there is a purging. So there's purging from both ends of the alimentary canal. You that know, bothers you wanna, me big time. I don't like time. that I idea. know. You, you want to be very near a bathroom. Um, you know, I remember I was in one ceremony, and um, this is just a typical ceremony story, and I'm managing to walk toward the bathroom. There are kind of never enough bathrooms as far as I'm concerned. Okay. And this guy is crawling back from the bathroom on all fours on the floor. And I stopped. I had enough of my wits about me. I stopped and I said to him, are you okay? <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> and this is, this, you know, it's just, you're just in a whole different place. Yeah. And, I, and I have, I, you know, I can tell a, a story of working with one of the guides myself. I, all of mm -hmm. a sudden I realized, well, when I, experimented with these entheogens. It was in the 60s in Big Sur. We were out in nature. We didn't even know about set and setting back then. We were sort of oblivious to a lot of things. And I realized I have not done these medicines in the standard protocol way that they're using in all the the, the research studies and that the women elders use with you know a blanket and eye shades and earphones. I had not done it. 
So uh, realizing I had not experienced what I was writing about, I made a date with one of the elders and did an MDMA journey. And I thought, well, th you know, this is the a, a, an empathy medicine. I thought, this will be fun. It's ecstasy. I'd been doing ayahuasca for 15 years. I thought, I deserve a break. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a fun experience. And so uh, what happened was I went right to the ayahuasca realms. Yeah. You know? And so it was a dark <laughs> journey. It wasn't what I would call fun. It was a lot about preparation for my own death, even though I don't have a terminal diagnosis. I'm just old. But it was a lot about my preparing for my own death and my own fears about um, facing death. And and at one point, I crawled to the bathroom on MDMA. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. people are out dancing under MDMA, <laughs> under the influence. So, you know, I, it, ayahuasca is challenging. And yeah. one of the ways I, I managed to continue to study with it um, is I take a smaller dose. So I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a big believer in heroic or what I call cowboy doses. I don't think <laughs> right. we have to, you know, blow yeah. the lid off our heads. But yeah. I'll tell you, I, you know, when interviewing one of the elders and I asked her about dosages and, and she said something like, you know, the lower doses, you can often work more with the medicine because you're not, you, you haven't lost yourself completely. You right. haven't fallen apart. And um, and then she pauses and she says, but I like to fly. <laughs> <laughs> so I would never say anything like that. I don't want to uh -huh. fly. Uh -huh. so, you know, it was so clear in so many ways that I am not of their 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 caliber in terms of being yeah. warriors. So they they are really up for anything kind of. And and at and the same that's with themselves. If I can just add at the same time. They're extremely careful about their medical intake interviews, are very extensive, and um, they work with, um, they have colleagues who are doctors and nurse practitioners, so they can bounce medical questions off of professionals. And they also know therapists they can refer to if needed. So they are not working alone. They, they have built a network. And they also consult with each other. So there, I just want to emphasize that because so many so-called psychedelic therapists are, are now saying, well, I've had an experience or two. I can begin to work with people. Right, yeah. Well, it, you know, these women worked on themselves for six, seven years. And then, and then they also did apprenticeships with more experienced people. They didn't just but start. So it sounds like, you know, we make a big deal about ethics in uh, in psychology, and uh, it sounds like they are guided by ethical principles themselves. They are, but I can't say that's true for the whole field. No, we have no. You know, we we don't really. You know, as no, psychologists, no, no there's we, a risk of overnight wonders, right? Who, thank you who are uh, practicing prematurely. Yes. Yeah, hanging out a shingle, so to speak. And I suppose that's one of the dangers, uh, you know, as we go forward in time, is that there'll be more people like that out there. Yes. Um, it seems like ceremony plays a big role. And maybe you should talk a bit about ceremony, because, you know, it sounds like all your ayahuasca experiences were in the context of ceremony. How do you see yes, ceremony? Absolutely. Yeah, what's yeah. the role of ceremony? You know, there's no ayahuasca without the ceremony. I mean, it's it's inseparable. I know some people are taking it in different ways, but for me, it's, it's embedded in the ceremony. And... Uh, and the Shapipo ceremony involves singing Icaros and, and a number of the other um, traditional approaches, different tribes involve singing sacred songs. And those songs convey healing energy that do cleaning and cleansing. I mean, 
it, it I think in the ayahuasca book I I said I said to the shaman who I work with I said here's my proudest statement from the ayahuasca book and this is someone who grew up in an indigenous village I said to him my proudest statement is the singing is the medicine he said that's right it's not the drug uh -huh. It's the singing, it's the ceremony, it's the whole energy involved in that. Yeah. And um, so it's it, we have to get out of our Western approach that it's the drug. And of yeah. course, the research is all about the drug. <laughs> right. And we need right. the research. We do need to understand that. But we also have to have uh, an openness to the power of the ceremony as well. Who do you see as the audience for this? second book well you know i hope i hope the the people who want to become psychedelic therapists psychedelic guides psychedelic coaches you know we now have coaches <laughs> um i hope that they will read it so they get an appreciation for the depth of work and experience and training that that the elders have gone through and there's there's a uh, when it really comes down to it, what makes the difference? And it's it's who you are, who the guide is inside. I mean, here's the quote from Laura Huxley. She says, the hardest thing for guides is to keep themselves out of the out of the journey. And mm -hmm. we know this as therapists. And and we also know it's not necessarily the technique, it's the therapist's own personal capacity for relationship with the client and the therapeutic alliance. And so it's this, it's the same thing with the guy, the, the, the elder sitting next to you and when you're working. So after my MDMA journey that, you know, and I, I'm in the coming down sort of recovering stages and thinking, oh man, that was rough. <laughs> the woman, that woman elder I was working with worked on me for about an hour clearing energy. So I don't understand exactly what she saw, what she was doing, but it felt wonderful. And at the end of that hour, the end of the session, I felt so light and healed. It was really extraordinary and wonderful. And that's ceremony. That's that she has the capacity and the training yes. to be able to do that. Yeah. By the way, I should mention, uh, I have a son who is a uh, a trained as a trip sitter. He's a nurse practitioner. And, oh, perfect. And uh, he's working with uh, ketamine. Yes. And, and um, so he's both above ground and has had some underground experience as well. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm not supposed to say that. No, I don't think you're supposed uh, to go there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, this, you, yeah, know, this is, right. we, uh, you know, I have hope for this next generation of professionals. Yeah. Um, I really do. You know, I'm, you know, by the time the medicines became legal, I was already retired. I wasn't, I was, I was too old to sit there for six or eight hours. I would fall asleep. I couldn't be a sitter. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have the same feeling. It doesn't exactly. seem that, that attractive. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to contribute for the next generation uh -huh. of people doing the, the psychedelic guiding and sitting and and therapy yeah is there another book uh in you that's, oh, that's uh, so gonna, that's... gonna be born <laughs> <laughs> you know there i can tell you there are no more footnotes <laughs> that i can tell you i can't keep up with footnotes. but i i think there is another book and it's more of a personal story and and here's the theme of the book <laughs> Okay. is that psychedelics are a part of a whole life. Now, you made a decision to stop. And, you know, as you say, you haven't used them in years. Yeah. But I I came back around to use them again. Yeah. And, um, and they can, and this is how people in the underground, they might come in, they might do a journey once a year. When I interviewed Kendra Smith, she was in her late 90s. She, she was very nostalgic. She said, the last journey I did, I was 85. I'd love to do another one. <laughs> uh -huh. so okay. It's it's kind of the the it, these journeys can bring you different 
learnings and openings at, at all different yeah. stages of life. And Albert Hoffman, who synthesized LSD-25, he lived to the ripe old age of 102. And when he was 97, he did an acid trip. So yeah. I think my, I mean, part of my story, well, you know, I've worked on myself all my life. So it's the story of this is what else is there to do in life, but work on ourselves and contribute what we can as a result of that work. And for me, psychedelics are a major part of that, as well as doing therapy and being in therapy. That is a great wrap-up statement, I think. Is there anything else that you want to say before we go? No, I think that's good enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, well, that's, 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 that's the next book that you were kind enough to ask uh, about. <laughs> okay, that's that's plenty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio, uh, Rachel Harris. Thank you, David. I've always wanted to be on your radio show. <laughs> oh, so, okay. Yeah, no, okay. this is wonderful for me.